Hi, this is Brian Crescenti from Vox Games, speaking to you from Sony headquarters in New York. And I'm here with Jack Trenton, the president and CEO of Sony Computer Entertainment of America. Jack, nice to see you again. Brian, great to see you too. So tonight you will be, you're staying up, I guess. You just flew in from the West Coast, but you're staying up for the, the launch of the Vita here in North America. Yeah, the morning came a little hard, but uh, by midnight I should be cooking. And you know, if you can't be excited about a platform launch, you shouldn't be in the business. I'm, uh, thrilled that this will be my uh, fourth platform launch with Sony and uh, very, very excited about Vita. Now this launch is, I know this is the, the full launch, but you've already had, I guess, a little taste of the launch with uh, an earlier version that came out, or a bundle that came out uh, a little earlier this month. Have you gotten any sort of numbers or do you have any sense on how that went? Yeah, it's the first time we've ever done that. We had a pre-sale bundle available uh, that gave consumers an opportunity to get it in their hands a week early, so they picked it up on the 15th, and we did see uh, some initial reads, and clearly we're dealing with the most hardcore of the core, but I was really pleased to see not only the number of games that sold, uh, but the depth of games, uh, and then also great, uh, great peripheral attach. Uh, a lot of people going out there and buying a lot of different accessories for Vita as well. Is there a particular game that's doing really well? Uh, were people going out sort of buying specific games for that when they got the bundle, or have you not seen that No yet? question about that, and really not a surprise there. Uncharted Gold and Abyss, I think, is the ultimate uh, launch game and really a testament to what the Vita can do. So Nier is, I think, a neat idea, the idea of sort of um, being able to pick up or drop off like presents to your friends I, I, through this sort of online network. I, I'm a little, a little confused in, in how I'm going to use it in the long term. Like I'm still, it's one, it's one of the newer things I guess that I experienced when I started playing around with the Vita. So how do you use it and like what kind of future do you think Nier has for the Vita and maybe for other PlayStation products down the line? Well, I think consumers in general and people, you, you take comfort in people that are living the same life that you are. So if you're traveling all the time, it's, you know, you, you realize that you're not the only one living out of a suitcase, uh, spending a lot of time in airports. If you're a gamer, um, you're real social, you want to share your experiences, you want to talk about your experiences with your friends. The great thing about Nier is I hit that button and I'm able to see an incredible amount of people that are gaming locally uh, and find out what they're playing, what they like, uh, make new friends that way, and it's done in a, um, you know, it's, it's done via GPS. So if I'm here in New York, I live in San Francisco, all of a sudden I'm exposed to all these people that are gaming in Manhattan uh, with the touch of a button. And it's amazing how much you have in common with the people that are out there gaming, not only the games you're playing, uh, but the type of games that you're interested in as well. I, one of the other things I noticed, I think everybody's going to notice, obviously, is the live area, which is sort of the interface that you guys have. We don't, we don't have the cross-media bar anymore. Um, what was the reasoning behind that? Do you think uh, that Live Area is going to be sort of the future of the user interface for PlayStation products? Well, I think in general terms, uh, we've really focused on the user experience and to try to make that as seamless as possible to make it, it as easy to use. And that's just something I noticed about the Vita initially, not only uh, the game controls, but the ability to toggle in and out of apps and get from point A to point B very easily and connect with other gamers. So do you, is it an experience you think that's specifically designed for the portable market or could we see this either coming to the PlayStation 3 or to a future hardware uh, that's sitting at home? Well, I, I think PlayStation has really been a bellwether among the Sony family in terms of uh, connected digital devices. And of course, the goal is to have all Sony uh, digital devices connected uh, in a format that people are very comfortable with and, and connect various devices at the same time, not only within the Sony universe, but outside it as well. So. I really see it as a potential sign of things to come on other Sony devices. Is, uh, this is maybe a little, a little too nitty gritty, but the PS3, does it have the ability to have that sort of massive change go live? Could you, for instance, do an update or a patch for the PS3 that would completely change the interface to something like uh, what the Vita has? I don't know that you're going to see uh, something that's identical to the Vita uh, day one, but I think if you look back on the history of the PlayStation 3, that interface has improved on a regular basis and has evolved. That being said, people have worked with it since 2006 and it kind of has its own look to it. Right. Uh, and Vita certainly works in concert with that. But uh, I, I don't think you're going to see a Vita 2.0 on the PlayStation 3 in the near future. You right. will see a lot of the features uh, influence each other, though. Gotcha. So the cross-media bar, you think? Or at least I think the cross-media bar is here to stay in, in PlayStation 3 for the foreseeable future. 
So the Vita, uh, we were talking a little bit earlier about how you might use the Vita. Well, one of the things I think is really interesting is that the Vita seems, from a design perspective, to be a device that wasn't created uh, with the idea of the form factor first. So it doesn't feel like Sony sat down and said, okay, this needs to fit in a pocket, and then we're going to figure out all the things we can put on it. It, it kind of feels like Sony wanted to design something that was a good d gaming device and then worried later about the form factor. Um, is that right? I mean, do you, was this about designing something that was a certain size or was it more about the experience? There's been a real focus across Sony for a number of years and I think Vita is one of the perfect examples of focusing on the user experience and putting uh, tools in the hands of the people that would create that user experience. I think historically we would create a great engineering technology and we would hand it off to software development teams and say, here, see what you could do with this. And then they'd try to create the best gaming experience and we'd turn to consumers and say, what do you think of this? I think we did it in reverse order this time. We said to you know, consumers, what would you ideally like to see in a device? We said to the software development community, what tools do you need to create the best possible games and user experiences? And then ultimately we designed device around it. So I think we did it uh, ideally from the user's perspective out as opposed to the designer's perspective in. I think uh, in designing something like this, there's always this risk um, when you're doing something innovative uh, that instead of making some, something innovative, you perhaps create something that's avant-garde um, in the sense that someone will see the device as interesting and different but over time might lose interest in it. So it's, it's, um, it becomes not something that, that can kind of jump that hurdle and become main, mainstream. Um, I, I, the Japanese uh, sales have sort of been dropping a little bit. Are you guys worried about that? Or do you think that there's going to be a main, mainstream appeal to this device? I think we've had a better focus around the design of Vita of any device that we've been involved in. And make no mistake, this was designed by gamers for gamers and if you're a gamer you will get it immediately when you hold it in your hand and you will see that we've created tools to create the ultimate games for gamers if you're not a gamer um, then you may not be able to get it day one and we'll eventually ideally get to you but we didn't design it for the casual consumer that dabbles with gaming we designed it for the hardcore gamer and we think we can reach out to the casual audience but clearly we designed it with the core gamer in mind would you say that this is going after the PlayStation 3 audience or do you think it's more the hardcore gamer like that broader like Xbox we PS3 audience and PC the the center of the bullseye is the PS3 owner male 20 something and I think the second concentric circle out from that is just core gamer in general. But I think the advantage of having a PlayStation 3 consumer as being the center of the target is they've already got their trophies, they've already got their friends, they've already got their online ID, they've got the PlayStation 3 experience and they're gonna appreciate the cloud saves and picking up a game that they had just paused on PlayStation 3 and taking it with them on the Vita. Going after the P PS3 market, you sort of outlined some of the things just now uh, that would make that uh, a little easier, you know. You don't have to essentially re-educate some gamers. Right. But are there? Are you guys already starting to think about? Okay, how do we appeal to someone who, for instance, owns an Xbox 360 and wants to have that full sort of core gaming experience on the go? You don't have that appeal built in of being able to say you can go from your Xbox to your Vita, obviously. So is is there uh, some way that you guys might sort of try to tackle that? You know, first and foremost, we're targeting gamers. And the good news is there's more gamers than there's ever been before. Supposedly there's a billion consumers worldwide that consider themselves gamers, 163 million in the United States. And those of us been gaming for a long time know that that was a much smaller audience back in the day. And now everybody considers themselves uh, somewhat of a gamer. And I think that's good, you know, that, that ultimately gets people to appreciate that this is mainstream entertainment. And for those of us who are dedicated to the gaming industry, it says, you know, you pick the right business to be in. It's bigger than it's ever been. So you mentioned uh, iPhone and tablet gamers earlier. You talked about uh, sort of, I, I guess everybody sees those, those people, people who game just that way or primarily that way as sort of the biggest, broadest audience. Um, is there a way, do you think, to attract uh, someone who's used to spending less than a dollar on a game to a system that, granted, has 
less expensive games but doesn't have dollar games and really it sound, seems to live in the 40 to 50 or 30 to 40 dollar range. I think there's a great opportunity because just gaming in general intimidated a lot of people. I mean just buttons and control and how do I make that work and why would I want to play a game and I think if you looked five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, you, you'd find the majority of people didn't consider themselves gamers and may have never played a game. Nowadays you know, just about everybody that you're going to encounter uh, is either playing currently or has played at some point in their lives. So it's less intimidating than it's been before. And so once you demystify gaming and you understand that it's not so hard to control characters and you realize the interactive and immersive nature of gaming, as I said, I think as it starts to hook you, you find yourself wanting more and more. You want more depth to the game, and you want more control of the characters. And that's where I feel we can really migrate up people up the food chain. And the great thing with a device like a PlayStation Vita, it doesn't have to be the $50 Uncharted experience. It can be 99 cent PlayStation Minis, which I think compare very favorably uh, to games that are available on smartphones. So that entire ecosystem is available on the Vita, uh, but it's not limited to those small form experiences. You do have the opportunity to play you know, the full form games like an Uncharted. It's interesting because, uh, we, again, we were talking about this earlier, but the idea of, um, I think over the years, w with the introduction of smartphones like the iPhone and Android phones, you've had this rise in devices that get people to make decisions in terms of what they're willing to accept uh, because of the convenience. So the convenience of having something in your pocket that you have to have there because it's a phone, but then we, we're starting to sort of see this, this turn now where people are going out, and I'm, I'm one of those people, I went out and I bought a Kindle. I can read Kindle books on my iPhone, but I went out and bought a Kindle because I like that. I like that it was de designed and developed for a book. So do you think that you can sort of convince people, like Amazon has convinced people with the Kindle, that they need to go out and buy a device that's made just a game and won't do other things? Well, you just hit the nail on the head, and you do probably know it better than anybody. If you're a gamer, uh, then you're going to gravitate towards a dedicated gaming device. Everything has a core competency, and you said it yourself. If it's a smartphone, it's a smartphone that can also game. And if gaming is number four or number five on your priority list for what you want that device to do, that might be good enough for you. But if you're a gamer, you're going to be drawn to something that's going to give you the ultimate gaming experience. Do you have any way of tracking or have you tried to sort of look at those people who are the Angry Birds game players or hidden object game players or you know the two minutes every three or four hour game players and seeing if they have the interest in sort of making that jump over from being super casual gamers to being what I guess we call now hardcore gamers? Uh, I think there's more interest than there's ever been before. I think back to the launch of PSP in 2005, and that was a, a dedicated gaming device targeted towards gamers. But the thought of getting um, a, a housewife or a, a businessman uh, onto the PSP was much more daunting to me than it is today. If some mom is sitting there playing Words with Friends or um, playing Angry Birds, um, and she sees a Vita uh, where she wouldn't even notice it before. You find them looking over to it going, you know, what the heck is that? And again, people uh, have the ability to see the, the visual effects. They see the graphics. They see the depth of gameplay, and they're, and they're going to be drawn to it. So I think there's absolutely that potential just from, you know, being able to demystify it and have people holding a controller in their hand, whether it's a, you know, a touch controller on a smartphone or whether it's a dedicated controller in a console than ever before. So I know we're running out of time. I really want to talk to you, though, about the PSP. So obviously, this isn't the first portable that you guys have launched. You have uh, seven years, I think, experience with uh, PlayStation Portable, and you had the PSP uh, um, come out. You had uh, four iterations of that, and then the PS Go came out. What do you think you learned from that? Because you mentioned several times sort of the launch of the PSP, and that came during a time when I think portable gaming wasn't, um, the expectation of portable gaming wasn't the same in many ways, in two different directions. You, there wasn't the expectation that you could have this really light, enjoyable experience, or that you could have this really hardcore experience. So what do you think you've learned from the PSP and applied to the Vita, and, and also, the Go, I thought was a really, I, I love the PSP Go. Um, I felt like it didn't get the consumer support it deserved. I was a big fan of it. Um, so what did you guys take away from that experience in, in coming out with the Vita? Well, tremendous lessons learned there. As I said um, earlier in the discussion, when we came out with the PSP, 
people saw a dedicated portable device. This is more casual, uh, is more youth oriented. We ushered in the older consumer, the more console-like experience, and we very successfully sold over 75 million units in that seven-year window that you referred to. Now, with the PlayStation Vita, we have promise of a lot of the things that uh, we attempted to do with the original PlayStation Portable. We've got the technology and the horsepower to be used in conjunction with PS3 much more than we did uh, back in the early days of PSP. We've got a true multimedia device that's really the, the expectation as opposed to uh, an ideal uh, expansion of the market as it was in 2005. But we've got the gaming and the user interface that we'd always hoped for, the dual analog sticks, the front and back touch, the dual cameras. So it's really the console gaming experience in the palm of your hand that we'd hope to bring to consumers. And quite frankly, I think we very proudly did based on 2005 technology. But as I said, the gaming universe is bigger than it's ever been before. We've established the fact that portable gaming isn't just for casual, isn't just for youth, that it can be for the core gamer as well. And I think we're going to reap the benefits of that with the PlayStation Vita. I, and I, well, very last question, I promise. Uh, I just wanted to get clarification because it seems like there's been a little confusion on the UMD passport program. Um, it's coming to North America, not coming to North America? It, it's not coming to North America. I mean, that was a, a program created in Japan for Japanese consumers. And I think if you follow Sony and you follow PlayStation in particular, you'll realize that the platforms are marketed very differently. They're at very different price points with different product offerings. And I think we're proud of the product offerings we have for the consumers in the States. Uh, but that's different from the product offerings and the way we market to consumers in Japan. So that was a Japan uh, program that uh, I believe worked fairly well for them. But we, we feel we've got uh, a good amount of offerings and a good value for consumers um, it, you know, with the existing program that we have. All right. Well, thank you very much for taking the time and, and good luck Brian. tonight. I think it's going to be it's going to be exciting. Thanks. I'm looking forward to it.